Hello, my name is Vivek and I'm with Team Talia for the live card plot and this is our final design review. I'll be going over the problem statement and sort of our motivation for our project. Um, and then later on in the presentation, we'll be doing a bit of a design overview and then diving into details about our three main subsystems, which are the drivetrain and enclosure, uh, the buoy deployment system, and the electronics and software. So first, our problem statement and product definition. Um, what are we doing and why? So in our initial search for uh, a good robotics problem, we were actually looking to aid in some sort of uh, preventable tragedy. So we were looking at different like statistics about what kinds of accidents people get into and uh, which ones would be you know, new ground for a robotics problem. And we actually found that a surprising number of people actually drown accidentally. And in a very specific age range, in a very like controlled condition. Um, so roughly like 12,000 people per year drown, uh, about 4,000 of those are fatal. And uh, amongst the sort of younger age group of like one to 14 you know, years old, it's actually the second leading cause of unintentional injury death, which is a specific type of record that the CDC keeps. Um, and most drownings for younger children occur in swimming pools. So infants like younger than one, if you have drownings that they might end up in like a bathtub, older than about 14 or 15, um, you're mostly thinking about like open water. So this particular scenario was a place that we thought could be a good robotics problem because the uh, conditions are a lot more controlled and we think we could have a big impact with uh, solving this type of issue. Um, rescuing a drowning person can be quite risky and can even result in the drowning of the rescuer if it's not performed safely. So what we're looking to do is rescue a drowning person thinking about like one to four years old with minimal uh, physical human interaction. And the sort of scope around that is backyard pools, like some of that you might see in the suburbs and like one to four year old children um, who aren't being supervised. And that's like really the main concern here is that um, these types of accidents occur when a parent or other uh, supervisor is not present in the pool. Um, so our goal is to rescue that person within about the first minute. Um, and why the first minute? Um, it's mostly just because that is the key uh, window for rescue. After a couple minutes, like three or four minutes, uh, the child can lose consciousness. And if you start pushing, you know, five, six minutes, um, the child could drown fatally at that point. So we're trying to uh, get a response time, you know, under a minute. Hi, my name is Zoe, and I'm going to be giving a high-level design overview for our robot. Here we have an assembled view of the robot and an exploded view. In the exploded view, we can see the six major components of the robot. There's the lid, the folded buoy, the deployment module, the upper enclosure, the electronics enclosure, and the drivetrain base. All of these components will be described in more detail in the later sections. In this section view, we can see how everything fits together. The deployment module is housed in the upper enclosure and the folded buoy sits directly above it. These two components are connected and they're held in place by the lid. The electronics enclosure is bolted to the drivetrain base. The drivetrain uses differential drive and rolls on idler wheels and rollers. We also have inductive charging on the flat base of the robot and a camera mounted to the top of the robot. Please note that some of the electronics are emitted uh, from this CAD. The rescue process takes place in three steps. The first step is detection, where the robot uh, determines the position of the child and the target location for it to move to. And this takes four seconds. The second step is transit, where the robot moves to the position directly below the child. This takes an estimate of 20 seconds. The third step is deployment, where the robot deploys the buoy and deployment module. And this takes four seconds for inflation and uh, 
the buoy rising to the top surface of the pool. Step one is detection. So the robot is docked in a corner of the pool and continuously charged with induction. When the robot detects that there's a child in the pool when they shouldn't be, it first detects the location of the child and determines its target position with April tag localization. This takes four seconds. The next step is transit. First, the robot rotates to face the target and then drives in a straight line to the desired position. The robot then repeats this process and corrects its position by determining its new position with April tags and then rotating and driving in a straight line until it is directly below the child. This will take, our estimate for how long this takes is 20 seconds. The third step is deployment. First, the solenoid valve opens, inflating the buoy, the buoy, initiating buoy inflation and applying pressure to the lid. The lid is designed to pop off at 0.9 pounds, which is almost instantaneous, and this releases the buoy and the module from the robot. The buoy then separates from the robot, fully inflates, and floats to the pool surface. This takes four seconds. Next, moving on to the drivetrain and enclosures, um, I will be giving a brief overview of the drivetrain and uh, the enclosures, different types of enclosures. So for the enclosure overview, um, we have, uh, it's, it will be manufactured with uh, injection molding and the material will be a high density, high density polyethylene uh, plastic material. Um, in total, the weight will be um, 35 pounds and its dimensions are 15 inches by 20 inches by 34 inches. Um, there is a lid, a snap-on lid, which we will go into more detail later, as well as the cover, uh, the base, and the vents um, along the sides and bottom of the uh, robot. <clears throat> uh, for the drivetrain overview, um, pretty simple. We will have front and rear ball rollers, um, as well as rubber idler wheels on the left and right side. Um, and the, uh, so these ball rollers and the wheels are, will both be idle um, and not powered. Uh, and the robot will be propelled only by the two thrusters, the Blue Robotics T200 thrusters mounted on the left and right side of the robot. Uh, we'll go into more details about these later also. So for these thrusters, some of the key features are that it comes in both the clockwise and counterclockwise orientations. Um, and so this is able to provide backwards thrust. Um, this is important for um, our differential drive um, robot so that um, we can also have the robot effectively turn uh, by propelling one thruster forward and the other one backwards. Um, in total, these thrusters are capable of producing about 40 to 60 newtons of thrust. Some other properties of uh, the thrusters, um, they are 10 centimeters in diameter and they operate at voltages um, seven to 20 volts. Um, higher volts will uh, generate more thrust. And <clears throat> the max throttle power is at three, 645 watts and uh, each propeller will cost $200. Uh, the plastic parts are made from polycarbonate, while the exposed metals um, in this propeller are made from marine grade 316 stainless steel. Uh, moving on to the wheels and rollers, um, pretty simple. Here are some enlarged images of the front and rear bob rollers, um, as well as the rubber idler wheels. The front and rear bar rollers are to allow um, the robot to turn um, about its center uh, without having to worry about a uh, turning radius. Um, so with the differential drive system, as well as the front and rear ball rollers, we can um, ensure that there is zero turning radius. Um, the rubber idler wheels are not ball rollers because uh, we want the robot to be able to withstand um, uh, blows or currents from the sides uh, when it's not moving. Uh, so, so it can move in a straight line more effectively. And then for the plastic ball bearings, um, uh, we 
had several choices. Um, we ended up choosing the plastic one um, based on a number of factors, um, including corrosion resistance and um, shock absorption and cost. These uh, plastic ball bearings are also um, widely available and uh, can be purchased very easily. <clears throat> all right, moving on to the electronics enclosure. This is where all of the electronics will be housed. Um, in total, its dimensions are 80 millimeters by 210 millimeters by 54 millimeters. Um, and the entire body plus lid will be made from uh, 316 stainless steel. Uh, so what goes into this enclosure on the components are two batteries, um, two buck converters, two five volt regulators, one Raspberry Pi, two electronic speed enclosure or electronic speed controllers, one DC to AC converter, one MOSFET, and uh, one USB-C port to uh, charge the batteries. Next, I'm going to talk about the enclosure lid snap-off design. The enclosure lid was designed to pop off at a force at an applied force of 0.9 pounds from the buoy inflation. It works because the force from the buoy inflation deflects the four snap beams according to classical beam theory, and this allows the beams to slide through the notches and the lid to pop off of the enclosure. We can model the snap features as beams to design them to pop off at a specified force. First, the deflection is calculated using equation one. Y max equals 0.67 times the strain times L squared divided by T. Next, equations two and three are used to find the frictional force and the deflection force. The frictional force is equal to mu plus tan alpha divided by one minus mu tan alpha and the deflection force is equal to B T squared times the flexural modulus times the strain divided by six L. These two forces can be multiplied together to find the snap mating force or the force required to pop off the lid. Plugging in the known numbers and using some trial and error, this these principles were used to determine geometric values for the snap features. I performed enclosures, CFD analysis, and fluent of our design in order to find the drag coefficient. The assumptions used for this analysis were first that there's laminar flow and this was based off the premise that it's in a pool with mostly still motion and um, helps simplify the analysis a lot. The fluid is defined to be water, which has a density of 998.2 kilogram per meters cubed and a viscosity of 0 0.00103 kilogram per meter second. The velocity of the water flow is two meters per second. And in this plot, you can see the velocity vectors colored by the magnitude, and you can see how the velocity changes as it goes over the surface of our body. And in the corner here, you can see the mesh that I defined for this analysis. And I defined an enclosure with distance of one meter perimeter around the shape of our enclosure. And I defined the inlet and outlet walls where the inlet has the flow of two meters per second velocity water, and then the outlet is just that boundary. And the resulting drag coefficient found is 0 0.45. So the main drive of our robot comes from the two thrusters that are located on the left and right of the enclosure. And this system was modeled after differential drives that we saw in literature for underwater robots, as well as for above ground robots. So how differential drives work is that usually it's powered wheels. And when you control them, you control the velocity. It also produces an angular velocity that can just define the 
path of motion for your robot. However, because we're working with thrusters, we're going to be working with the forces of that are produced from the thrusters. So you are considering um, forces FL and FR, and just like um, a on-ground differential drive, we can also control them for a desired path that we want for our trajectories. So they also form a instantaneous center of curvature and the robot will turn with an angular acceleration at radius r and also have net linear acceleration of fl plus fr so important combinations to note from this differential drive system is that when both thrusters are on meaning that they have the same value of fl and fr then the robot will go straight at angle theta however when the thrusters are on opposite values, so FL is equal to negative FR, the robot will turn in place, and that is useful so that we can control the angle theta until desired. So just to go more in depth about the thruster combinations I just talked about, on the left we have the first three by diagram regarding the linear motion of the robot, so when FL and FR are in the same direction at the same value, we have that the net force is the thrusters minus the drag. And from this, we can find the max velocity um, from this system, whereas when the thrusters and drag produce no net acceleration, then the robot's moving at full constant velocity and it can't go any faster. So this um, expression was derived from that. And we have the values of the drag coefficient as determined from the CFD as seen earlier. We also have the values of the width and the height as determined um, in an earlier um, slide. And the density of water is known. We also were able to find the max acceleration of this robot by setting F drag to equal to zero. What this means is like when the robot first starts moving and it turns on, um, then we have this F drag equals zero moment and we can find out just how much acceleration that it's able to produce in that kind of instantaneous moment. And we have that value there. We were also able to find the max time needed to turn by integrating alpha and finding when theta equals to pi over four. So the reason why we consider theta equals pi over four is because the max amount of turn that this robot needs to take into account for is a perpendicular turn. And then we take pi over four so that it can accelerate to pi over four and then decelerate to zero so that it stops at the perpendicular mark. So that time expression was found using those in your consideration. And yeah, uh, the value for mass and uh, moment of inertia were determined using SOLIDWORKS and uh, the distance D was also measured um, in SOLIDWORKS as well. So with that, we moved on to trajectory analysis and we were considering a 10 foot by 16 foot by eight foot size pool. And we modeled it in both WeBots and in MATLAB. However, um, for more simulation sake, we used MATLAB just because we were more comfortable and we weren't too confident with the WeBot simulations, but both of them included a flat pool floor and that the robot moves in a straight line. And the bounding conditions were that the robot is initially at rest at the corner of the pool. And then when it detects the child and moves towards it, it has to come to a complete stop before releasing the buoy. So it will have zero velocity at the end of its motion. And uh, one consideration that we can, we want to design a robot around was to cross the diagonal within 20 seconds. So with the given parameters that we talked about with the sizing and the inertia, um, we found that the robot operates um, this diagonal crossing at a max net acceleration of 0 0.084 meters per second squared and a max velocity of 0 0.43 meters per second. So that's within the full 20 seconds expense that we allotted for. So it can definitely go faster. But yeah, I think that this gives us a lot of confidence that um, the robot can get where it needs to be in a given amount of time. So um, usually drowning and brain damage will onset at around three minutes. So the fact that we have so much time to accomplish the robot's motion to that point 
is very good. We performed more trajectory simulations to see like, oh, what if the child like thrashes back? What if it zigzags and the robot needs to like account? Because right now the robot's path of motion is to sense the child, move to the point underneath it, and then look up again. And then if the child does move, move again. And it'll keep doing this until it is comfortably within a close enough range. So in the second um, kind of simulation, you'll see that points D and C were very close. So the simulation ended um, pretty similar in time than the fifth simulation that only has 18.41 seconds. It's because the points were close enough that it could just release the buoy. Um, but yeah, just from this like flat traversing, it, we are pretty confident that the within a minute, the robot can get to where the child is and it can it is able to turn and it is able to achieve that kind of motion to get to the child hello uh, welcome to the deployment system overview um, the deployment system is made up of two major parts they include the um, the buoy and then the actual sort of uh, deployment plumbing and pressure and system and controls um so first the overview for the plumbing box um it's pretty simple it contains a pressure vessel um a fill valve two safing valves and a solenoid which um controls the fill of the uh buoy um using a circuit and inductive communicator and um, a set of batteries, uh, several three volt CR2s. So this is our PNID diagram. So overall uses quarter inch NPT plumbing. Um, the vessel operates at approximately 850 to 1000 PSI, depending on the surrounding temperature. All parts are rated to at least 1200 PSI. Um, let's see. So first, um, we have our Kovna solenoid valve. It's a 12 watt or 12 volt, 18 watt uh, DC operated solenoid valve. Um, it's rated to 1400 psi. It's got a steel body, a PTFE seal, um, and it's normally closed. It is the primary means um, once the system is armed of releasing CO2 into the buoy. We have two safing valves, uh, which are controlled using Allen keys. Um, these are a quarter inch female to female um, NPT valve, ball valve, um, all rated to 1500 PSI uh, with a brass body and a PTFE seal. Um, the first one, which connects to the solenoid, um, allows it to be shut off in event of uh, some kind of electronic failure, which either causes this solenoid to suddenly open um, or oscillate in some strange form. Um, and the second valve um, is basically just uh, another precaution um, for the Schrader check valve, which we use to fill. Um, so this is our Schrader valve, which we use to refill uh, our pressure vessel. Um, it's a quarter inch MPT to a .305 inch Schrader. Uh, the maximum pressure can experience is 4,000 psi, which is way over uh, what the system should ever experience. It's also got a brass body. It's connected to the safing valve behind it, um, which is all connected to a brass T in the center. Um, the piping itself is quarter inch NPT aluminum, uh, whereas the pressure vessel is uh, a steel body. Um, then the top of the system uh, is an access lid, um, which is secured with 12 number two dash 56 screws. Um, there's a gap in there, which allows for a PTFE gasket, which once all the screws are clamped down, um, creates a watertight seal under eight feet of water. Uh, this whole chassis is made of uh, high density polyethylene plastic. Uh, the safing pins I was talking about earlier, I know they seem a bit long, um, but 
Um, they're definitely strong enough to handle 50 pounds inches of torque, which is the required torque to turn uh, those ball valves. Um, uh, you can see I performed some simulations here uh, with 50 pound inches of torque uh, applied to an Allen key insert at the front of it. Um, it's got a factor of safety of about seven. Um, simple Allen keys used to turn them by the technician when it's ready to operate or by the user in the event that it needs to be safed and the user is able to understand. Um, I also did calculation to estimate our deployment time. So for our fill assumptions, uh, we have a quarter inch pipe diameter, um, internal tank pressure of roughly 800 PSI operating under eight feet of water. Um, buoy does not rise in this situation. So constant external pressure and the pressure in the buoy is equal to the external, external pressure. And the pressure drop overall is less than or equal to 20 PSI. Um, so with this, the time to complete fill is about four seconds. Um, and the time to 50% fill is about 1.5 seconds. Um, I calculated this using a pretty simple um, uh, Bernoulli's and Eulerian method that used the velocity at the exit to calculate the mass flow rate and then use that to slowly reduce the pressure in the bottle. Um, yeah, so it comes out to a very quick fill time. Um, the rise time is actually even faster. So we assume that experience is an average buoyancy of 50%. Um, so assuming it doesn't rise at all by the time it gets to 50%, um, so 1.5 seconds have passed, um, it will have an acceleration of 51 meters per second squared. Um, this also assumes that drag is negligible. So then we can apply simple kinematic equations to find the time before it reaches the surface. Um, to get to eight feet, it takes 0 0.4 seconds, which um, is the entire rest of the time it will take to fill. Therefore, the total rise time uh, is gonna be basically, the total rise and deploy and fill time is gonna be about four seconds. This is our production buoy design. The material is polyvinyl chloride, which is flexible. The diameter of the inflatable is 65 inches. The internal support height is four inches and the external support height is seven inches. This is so we can prioritize optimizing low need for CO2 to fill the entire flotation device, but still achieve the height in the middle and the lift required to lift the kit out of the water. We also use this netting, as you can see in the bottom picture, which wraps around the buoy and it will support the child if they fall um, off the side of one of the internal supports in the middle. The mass of the production buoy, the PVC, is 5.43 pounds. The volume of this PVC is 116.56 cubic inches, and the volume of CO2, which inflates this, is 0 0.13 meters cubed. The wall thickness of this PVC is 0.02 inches, which we determined after doing some research on the normal thickness of a pool flotation device, which is around 0.01 inches or less normally, and more rigorous river tubes, which can be 0.05 inches or more. So going into the material selection for the buoy, I examined polyvinyl chloride manufacturing methods. And I also examined polyurethane, which is used more for very high grade river rafting kind of devices. So the polyvinyl chloride can be glued, which has a chemical or molecular bond strength. It's good in terms of durability and cheap in cost. On the other hand, you could also get this polyvinyl chloride welded, which has molecular bond strength it's optimal for durability. It's stronger than if it's glued, and it's still relatively cheap. Looking at polyurethane, it's also welded and molecular bond strength with optimal durability, which is slightly better than the PVC that's welded. But the issue is that the cost is very expensive, and the manufacturing for polyurethane is not as established, and it's a lot more difficult to establish a factory pipeline 
than a welded PVC sort of system. So we're going with a welded PVC buoy design. Looking at the integration of the buoy and the deployment system as a whole, we have the PVC inflatable, which will be bonded to an aluminum insert with quarter inch NPT thread. Um, and this will be female threaded so that it integrates with the deployment system, which will be male threaded. And the reason for this is that um, the NPT threading needs to be a metal for it to uh, properly seal and prevent leakage of any gases such as RCO2, which we want to be able to totally inflate in the inflatable and we don't want to worry about any sort of loss of CO2 or leakage. And this NPT kind of insert system is proven. It's used in a lot of high pressure applications. The bond method is a little trickier because it is aluminum, a metal with a plastic PVC. So I did research and found that a common usage is a Loctite 480, which is a rubberized cyanoacrylate adhesive. And it's proven to adhere aluminum to PVC well. And then we would use a primer, which is the Loctite 770, which goes hand in hand with this epoxy. And it's used commonly for this kind of treatment. Our process would be first cleaning the surface of the inflatable, priming it with Loctite 770, and then attaching a little seam of inflatable material that will perform as a fillet and help attach the aluminum insert to our inflatable device. And we'll seal that off with the Loctite 480 bond. For testing our deployment system, we uh, decided to answer questions that we couldn't um, answer just by looking at like publicly available literature, like research papers, or something we couldn't simulate easily through like MATLAB or Rebots. And um, so the first of these questions was, will the inflatable go straight up when released from the pool floor? So to do that, we held the buoy at the bottom of the pool and released it, noting the direction it took to go to the surface in about four feet of water. Um, we tried with both of these buoys. The one on the left has holes in it, which allow water to pass through. Um, our thinking was that this would help it go straight up because it wouldn't um, be like sort of deflecting the water too much at um, various angles. Um, and this was successful. The buoy with the holes in it did go straight up. Um, and the buoy on the right, which is just sort of like a flat piece of balloon, um, kind of shot off at an angle. So. Um, this sort of validated our production design, which has like sort of the space for water to pass through as it rises um, and should go straight up. So that was a successful test. Um, our second test it was um, testing our CO2 sizing and inflation timing calculation to see if they're reasonable. So we inflated uh, our smaller buoy with 12 grams of CO2 out of water and timed how long it took to fill. Um, So you can see here, um, just by touching off, so the system is actually a modified rocket recovery system. And by touching off the EMAT with gunpowder at the end to a battery, the gunpowder sort of explodes and drives the CO2 um, into the buoy. So you can see here, it takes about half a second to inflate. And we measured the volume of this inflatable after the fact, and it was about um, 0.1 meters cubed. Um, and this timing with like the orifice size of the CO2 um, and the volume that it expanded to is in line with our MATLAB simulated CO2 sizing and timing calculations. So that was also a successful test. Um, and then our final question was, will mutual inductance work to wirelessly transfer current underwater? So to do this, we programmed an NFC card to interact with the phone and um, then held both the card and the phone underwater. Uh, and to try to see if they would, uh, if the phone would induce underwater. And this is also a successful test. Uh, I programmed it to open the weather app on my phone and it did that. 
underwater. So um, this sort of validates the use of mutual inductance in two places on our design, um, both at the, the dock, where it wirelessly like hold, tops up the charge, and with the um, communication to open the solenoid, uh, which is sent through induction coil for a wireless um, transfer. So our testing was successful and helped validate our deployment model. Hi everyone, this is uh, the electronics portion of our, uh, of our final design review. So let's get started. We get to get started on uh, the circuits um, involving our Raspberry Pi, our batteries, um, and controlling our, our motors, our thrusters. Um, we could start looking at um, our battery supply. There's two 22.2 volt LiPo batteries connected in parallel. And the reason we did this is that um, we have two equal thrusters or two, um, you could say parallel uh, circuits going on here. And it's important that we have equal current draw at all times. So we have uh, the same maximum draw on both on both motors being used when um, the robot is on is going full throttle. So from here, uh, the batteries are connected to two bug boosts that output uh, 20 volts for the ESC. And here the ESC uh, is connected to the brushless motor. And in the input we have um, the input's connected to two of the GPIO pins that have separate, uh, separate uh, PWM channels. So the Raspberry Pi, if need be, uh, can control uh, separate PWMs and change the course of direction. So from the bug boost, we can go to the five volt regulators, which they're uh, which in their power the Pi itself. And then at the end of the Pi, we can see there's a GPI, GPI open connected to the switch MOSFET. That is uh, going to be very important because the switch MOSFET is connected to our uh, DC AC inverter, which is going to be, which is powered from the 22.2 uh, volt batteries, which is going to power our inductive coil from our, uh, the buoy deployment system which uh, hopefully was talked about earlier, but we're, we're using um, inductive coils uh, to transfer uh, voltage and current from uh, one part of the robot to the compartment holding all the buoy systems. So uh, we can take a closer look at that circuit right here. So for um, inductive communication system, we have what I just pointed out are uh, DC to AC inverter that's going to control or that's going to essentially send the signal across these two coils to here we have a relay that's going to control the current going into the solenoid valve, inflating the, the, the buoy. So here we have a uh, AC voltage. It when activated goes through here, goes through this diode, um, activates the switch. And once these switches go from um, normally closed to, uh, to normally open, this LiPo battery, 12 volts in the buoy deployment compartment will then take control of the switch itself. And now the switch will always be on um, the normally open pins which is then gonna give a constant current going into the solenoid. And um, here we have just like a safety diode so the solenoid doesn't get damaged. And then also this diode right here, make sure that this, um, this is gonna produce an AC current, um, just theoretically it will. So this diode is gonna produce um, a pulsating DC voltage signal that's gonna be used for the, the relay, but we're only going to need it for a split second. Just as soon as the, the switch, um, the 12 volt battery um, takes over and we're actually not going to need this anymore. We're only going to need it for a quick second. And um, I guess I'll look at this maybe in a little bit more detail. 
Um, just to make it clear, we have a, the DC inverter from the Raspberry Pi from the electronics enclosure. Going through this coil, which is this coil right here, the secondary one will be the input voltage for the relay. And um, voltage wise, uh, we are looking at a DC AC inverter of like commercial use, something that's gonna take an input of around 20 volts and then output 110 uh, AC volts, which will realistically have some power loss due, uh, due to eddy current or due to uh, um, just imperfections in the wires. But um, it will be like, it will be less than 110 uh, voltage or AC voltage, but we're only, again, like I said, only gonna need it for a second. So voltage is a huge concern. And then, uh, like I said earlier, the 12 volts will um, take over. And then uh, moving on, um, this is a little more rudimentary, not as, uh, not as clear cut circuit diagram, but uh, our charging, uh, our charging dock. We are using batteries of 22.2 volts, uh, 2200 milliamp hours. And um, so in order to charge these, we're going to look at a 1C rating. So we need to supply 22 volts and uh, uh, 2.2 amps. So to do this, we're just going to wire and plug straight into an outlet, 110 BAC outlet operating at 60 hertz. Um, send it to wire this to a transmitter a primary coil in our charging dock, which will then uh, create a magnetic field and create a current in our secondary coil, uh, our receiver, which is in the robot. And I believe it was already talked about, but the inductive charging will be located in the base of the robot where it will connect to the charging dock in the base of the pool and most likely stay there for as long as the robot is inactive. And from there, we'll have uh, theoretically a 110 BAC, which we could then uh, go AC to DC using a rectifier current. And uh, 110 BAC isn't, after going through a rectifier current, won't give you 110 volts DC. Uh, like theoretically, it will actually give you um, 100 volt or 170 volts DC because uh, the 110 is just a three and square. But uh, so we have a lot of voltage to work with as long as there's not a huge amount of a loss, but we are planning on using um, shielding coils. We've been referencing this um, or following this research article that um, explains the benefits of shielding coils and uh, how effective it is in a, a power transfer system due to, uh, you know, the power loss due to eddy current. But, um, so we have a lot of voltage to work with. Um, theoretically, in a perfect world, 170 volts, but we could use a, we, this gives us a lot of leeway on a buck, our buck boost we could use to, um, to give an output voltage of uh, 22 volts and um, uh, 22 amps, which will then go to this parallel charging board that will um, charge our two 22.2 uh, uh, LiPo batteries. So yeah, that was the idea. So Dylan talked a little bit about uh, charging, in particular the induction, but I wanted to go into a bit more specifics about our two charging systems, um, which were uh, basically the inductive charging is designed to keep the batteries topped off. Uh, so we also have a second charging system uh, that is required to be done by the user before first use and then after each deployment um, to recharge the batteries to full. Uh, and then uh, you put it on the dock and it keeps the, the charge up uh, even though the Pi is running. So basically this top circuit here, um, this is what Dylan showed. Uh, you take 110 volts AC from the wall. Um, you have to do some uh, frequency conversion. So 
Um, in this case, this is kind of simplified, but you have to go from 60 hertz to somewhere between 100 and 200 hertz uh, for uh, inductive charging to work. Um, and that number is determined by how far the coils are apart, uh, how big the coils are and, and other such things. Um, but in this case, the easiest way to do that is basically to convert AC to DC and then DC back to AC at a higher uh, frequency. Uh, so we do that, we send that to the um, transmitter coils and then uh, you receive that in the receiver coils through induction that goes through a rectifier um, or sorry, that's converted to DC, then goes to a rectifier. Uh, and then that DC is uh, made sure that it's 22.2 volts before it goes to a battery management system. And then it goes to the parallel charging system that uh, Dylan was talking about and charges the batteries. So that's what we see here. Um, but then we also have a type C charging and that's to be plugged in and to be done via power delivery. So type C power delivery um, can handle up to 20 volts at five amps, uh, which is more than enough for in terms of amperage. And then for voltage, we can just use a uh, boost converter for that. So to convert the 20 volts to 22.2 volts, um, and each of these systems would only work uh, one at a time. So if we're charging via type C, we're not charging via induction. If we're charging via induction, we're not charging via type C. Um, and so both of those systems are gonna be connected in parallel to our battery management system, which will then charge our batteries. Uh, pivoting a little bit, uh, we calculated the batteries. So the batteries in the corner here, uh, these 2200 uh, milliamp hour 50C batteries are the plan and we will have two of them. Um, and the reason for that is because our thrusters, uh, if you look over here on the right side, we can see the uh, spec sheet for the thrusters. So each one we want to have as much power as possible. So 20 volts at 32 amps. Um, and so basically via these calculations, uh, we determined that we needed 2200 milliamp hours for two minutes of runtime, which is what we expect to be like the maximum amount, amount of time to um, get to the child and deploy the, the buoy successfully. Um, and then this ESC uh, in the middle here pictured is uh, the one that goes with the uh, thrusters that we're using. Uh, it's designed by the same company, so it's guaranteed to work together. Um, and then these leads will connect um, to the batteries basically, um, not directly because we have to go from 22.2 volts to 20 volts, but using that buck converter. So the buck converter will have screw terminals. The spade terminals will go into the screw terminals. On the other side, we'll connect the XT60 connectors um, to the input of the buck converter. Um, and then the, this black thing um, is ground and signal for the Pi to uh, give the PWM signal to make the motor spin. Um, and so we have a discharge rate calculation and we have a 50C battery. So plenty of uh, quick discharge. And that's kind of why uh, we went with LiPo batteries because they, they discharge quickly or they can discharge quickly. Um, and then we already went through the inductive system. Um, okay. So pivoting again a little bit to the child sensing, which is obviously important uh, for our robot, which is detecting a drowning child. Um, that will be done via a camera from, from above. So for example, a security camera um, that uh, will be mounted on like the person's house or on a pole or something in their backyard. Um, and so we are using this paper uh, created by some um, computer engineers um, and it's called an automatic video-based drowning detection system for swimming pools using active contours, which uh, the TLDR of that is basically what's going on on the left here. So you take the camera feed, um, you do a little pre-processing with color space changes, and then you basically um, use OpenCV to determine contours in the frame and then use those contours to determine uh, the largest item in the frame, which would be the person um, in a time. In particularly in our case, it would be in a time when um, we uh, don't expect anyone to be in the pool and the camera is pointed you know, specifically at the pool. If something goes in the pool, um, and it's larger than a specific size, then we determine, you know, that's a person, we should save them. Um, so you can see some photos here. Um, this in the middle, this is the comparison of um, the uh, color space output that you'll see um, in the next slide as well, uh, comparatively with the uh, detection of the, the person. Um, and then on this right side, you can see the green, the ones with the green boxes in the corner are ones where they're above the water, the ones in the red box are when they've now disappeared under the water. 
Um, so this is how they're detecting the drowning. And in our particular case, we don't even need to detect the drowning per se. We just need to detect the person because they shouldn't be in the pool if it's you know not pool time. Um, so you can see we have these boxes here that say you know this is where the person is. Um, and so using that, we can determine coordinates. Um, and so or earlier in the quarter, um, I did. I will talk over this, but um, I created a script that does basically what they did in this paper. So um, you'll see it in a second running, um, but let's see if I can speed it up. Okay. Um, let me speed this up. Um, but basically it does the same thing the paper does, um, where it, you can see that object, um, it determines the center of that object and where you need to move uh, in order to get that object into the frame. So it does a little bit more than their, pro, uh, their paper does, but it does the same kind of thing where it's finding the contours um, and then using the area to determine uh, where the item is. And then it's determining the center of that. So from that center point, um, then we have a pixel location um, and that pixel location within the frame can be used to determine uh, coordinates inside the pool. And the way that that will work, I'll just go on to the next slide. Um, how do I continue to the next? Okay. So basically, you're going to have kind of like what you see in the bottom right corner where you had um, a video of the pool. And so you can see the edges are like what we call uh, keystone uh, compensation is like when you take the edges that look like they're not straight lines and you turn them into straight lines. So basically what's going on here on the bottom left. Um, and this is a pretty simple operation. It can be done like in Photoshop even. Um, it's done on like projector screens and stuff like that. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's just like a simple transformation. Um, and then we have distortion uh, from the fisheye lens um, that a lot of cameras use. Uh, but that we actually had to account for in our April tag uh, code. So we've already dealt with this, and this photo is actually pulled from the documentation for the April tag code that we were using to do that distortion calibration. Um, so the distortion calibration is figured out. Um, you'll see that in the April tag videos. And then the keystone um, is pretty straightforward. Um, and the way that that works is basically using the keystone, we would be able to take the pixels in that frame and determine where the edges of the pool are. Um, and from where the edges of the pool are, we know, we would know where our robot is because we would tell it where the dock, we would tell the software where the dock is. So let's say the dock is at the bottom left corner and that's like coordinate zero, zero. Um, then the keystone calibration would give you a rectangle that defines the shape of the pool. And then um, based on that rectangle, the, what we did in the previous slides where we found um, the person in the frame, um, we can use that pixel reference along with um, the pixel references of each of the corners to determine where uh, locationally the child is in the pool. Um, and so then we can do the pathing that I believe Thomas talked about earlier in the video, uh, where you basically, you go to that coordinate and then you look up with the camera in the pie and you check to see if the child is there and you correct accordingly, um, determining a new coordinate if necessary. And that's doing the same thing that this camera is doing just from underneath. Um, so basically the camera is on the pie, um, attached to the robot, looking straight up, uh, wide angle lens. So same thing with the distortion and everything, but no need for the keystone. Basically you just look for the child in the frame and because of the April tags, the robot knows where it is. So it knows where it needs to move to get to the child because it's based on relative positions. Uh, so then it recalculates and then it moves towards the child. Uh, and now it's under the child and then it deploys the raft. So the April tags, um, this is a quick video that I made with uh, detection. And uh, I kept this one in particular because this was one I was still using the uh, wired version of the Pi. I wasn't running it on the battery yet. And at the end, I got to the end of the wire and you can see me dropping the Pi. Uh, but you can still see that the tags are being detected even in like mid drop. So we'll just watch that real quick. It's only 10 seconds. And you can see those tags are on the wall. And those are tag number 13 and 14. Those are tags 11 and 12. So each of the tags says it, see, there's where I dropped the camera and it's uh, catching everything still. Um, and you can see the bottom left corners of all the tags are marked. Um, so using that, uh, using the numbers, using some calibration, 
um, we know where we are in a given room. So for example, uh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, so this is a video that I recorded. And so on the right, you'll see the, the end plots. Basically, what happens is I start um, from what will be that corner of the room, um, and I move to that corner of the room. You can actually see the tags are still on my walls. Um, but basically, um, you can see at the beginning, it does a little bit of calibration stuff as it's playing around because it sees both tags five and six and then seven, eight. Um, but it figures itself out, you'll see in the video. Um, but this plot on the right side, this is two different angles. You'll see that the Y direction, that's like between the floor and the ceiling in this reference frame, um, is basically flat. So because my arm isn't moving, it's moving. And so that's accurate. And then you can see a straight line being drawn up until that um, red point. And then that red point is basically that corner over there. So it's my, my end point. I'm moving towards that. And so you'll see that in the video. And so that's the calibration part. And then it starts to figure itself out there. And then it moves straight towards uh, that corner point that I pointed out before. Um, so that's basically how the, the preliminary uh, demo of how the April tags work. We should have a, a more fleshed out demo for demo day that you should be able to play around with. Um, but that's basically how the April tags work. And those April tags will be placed, um, installed by the end user um, inside of their pool on the sides of the pool, um, kind of like, on the, towards the bottom, out of the way, so they're not like ugly or anything. They're kind of just like look like pool tiles, um, and we'll have like basically waterproof stickers, kind of that that need to be placed um, in the pool. In conclusion, our um, our robot is designed to locate the child, move across the pool floor, um, and send the buoy up to catch the child who's drowning in um, a maximum time of 28 seconds. Um, according to the timeline of like child drowning and brain damage and death, um, it takes about three minutes for, um, with no oxygen uh, for a child to become like brain damaged and five minutes for the child to fully drown. So um, 28 seconds is really good um, and would effectively save the child and make sure they were still relatively healthy um, with this robot design. Uh, our design is also successful in that um, it's easy to manufacture and it's accessible for the consumer and safe to use with our um, design. We tried to make it as foolproof as possible, um, keeping in mind like the pressures. So um, we think all in all this robot would be uh, a good product for a homeowner with a pool. Um, some future work that we would do if we were to develop this further. On the mechanical side, we would um, do some more manufacturing and testing of all components. Um, and, like we would build the, the production drivetrain and calibrate it. And same with the buoy deployment system. Um, we would optimize the cell for uh, hydrodynamics and decrease the size of the deployment module on the shell to make it a smaller craft. Um, and then also reduce the mass. Um, and then we would also try to design it to include pools with inclined slopes and larger areas. On the electrical side, we would design a custom PCB to combine all the components on one board to save space and mass. Uh, heat, have heat pipes for water, water cooling in the electronics enclosure. Um, have child detection without need for external cameras in small pools um, to make it a more simple system for the consumer and improve child sensing to work on slopes um, at the bottom of the floor. Thank you.